Hi, everybody. We're here with Christopher Schwarz of Lost Art Press talking about his new article in Mortis and Tenon issue two. Uh, Chris is talking all about the Roman workbench, the low Roman workbench, uh, its work holding and its use. So we're excited to talk with Chris about that. Uh, Mike and I got our copies of issue two from the Freight Company uh, yesterday, and we've been flipping through it. And we're super excited, particularly with Chris's article. Uh, lots of clear photography and really fascinating discussion about work holding. And, uh, so we're going to talk with Chris more about this uh, here. So thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. So the first question I guess I wanted to ask you um, was, you know, I know you had a lot of time you spent on the Rubel bench. You were focused on that for a long time. So I was fascinated to find you focusing on this earlier workbench. And so I'm wondering if you could explain uh, what prompted you to do that research and that kind of exploration, and then what you found, you know, like where we find this bench in history. Well, you know, the Rubeau bench and the Nicholson bench, what we kind of call them now today, uh, they've really only been around since the 1700s. And woodworking uh, has been around for a lot longer. So it's kind of, I guess, narcissistic or something to assume that, that um, the people who would, were, were working either before this didn't have a really effective way to do it. And so I'm always looking for something uh, that makes people's lives simpler. Uh, you know, I, I started woodworking on very complex and daunting benches as far as things to build that uh, it usually took you about a year uh, to build it before you could get to the good part, which is furniture. So this has always been about, not about some obsession with workbenches per se, but more an obsession with finding shortcuts so that people could say, you, say, you don't have to buy a workbench, you don't have to use fancy material, you can get to the good part, which for me is, is making furniture. So I went back and started looking at the historical record and you start with the Egyptians, of course, and they invented almost everything that we use today in, in some form, but they really didn't have workbenches uh, that we would consider a workbench. They would use rocks uh, that had notches in them. Uh, you see uh, drawings of that, and, and they'd use their bodies a lot, which you know sort of is, is a good clue as to what was coming next, but there were no workbenches per se, and the first workbenches we have uh, are from Roman times, and that we have clear depictions of them. I actually, since I wrote that article, I found three existing Roman workbenches that are still around, which is oh, wow. kind of mind-blowing. It's uh, Salberg in Germany. They uh, have three of them that were remarkably, that, that were preserved with their, uh, looks just like the one that's in your magazine. Uh, it's low, it's, uh, the, the legs have disappeared, but the mortises are still there, the work holding is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're hoping to get some photographs of that uh, to sort of expand on the idea. But they're, they're really fascinating and, and they're really odd looking, sort of like the one that we saw at Jonathan Fisher's uh, that day when you took me around his place. And you think it's just some bench that, a uh, sitting bench that some kid went to town with a brace on. Uh, but those sort of patterns, uh, holes in the, in the top, really struck a chord with me after a long time. And you sort of connect the dots between, you know, that workbench that Perdix is sitting on at Pompeii and, uh, you know, workbenches throughout the Middle Ages. And then all of a sudden, boom, still in Estonia in the 1950s, you have these benches. So they've always been around us, but we've never really given them their due or recognized them as, as useful. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Um, so I know that when, when you and I were talking about uh, articles for Mortis and Tendon, and we were talking about ideas back and forth, you would pitch this article. I was really interested in it because um, particularly you talked about how you wanted to do in this article something that you weren't going to do in your book necessarily. You wanted to do something yeah. different from that. So I wonder if you could uh, you know, explain a little bit about what your objective was with this article and how it's going to be different from your upcoming book all about it. Yeah, the, the article is pretty practical, you know, and I hope that when people see it and read it that, you know, the first off, they won't just reject it as stupid um, because there's about 1,500 years of history where everything was built that way, even dovetails, mortise and tenons, all that. Um, 
and high benches and low benches coexisted peacefully for you know fifteen hundred years. Um, I hope that they see that you know there are things you can do sitting down, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, I, I sit a lot more now um, because of this this research. Uh, so I hope there's things that they can take away from it. And you know what? It's, it's five pieces of wood. And, you know, I hope that a few people take a chance and, and, and build one just based on that to see how it, it works. If, if it doesn't work, it's a great place to sit for Thanksgiving. Um, the book is more of a, uh, a, I don't know how to describe it. Um, it's, it's going to be less of the practical and more of how the weird tale of research goes. And yeah, there will be stuff that you can learn and, and take away from the, uh, uh, from the work holding and the ideas, but a lot of it is how strange and bizarre it is to do some of this research in European uh, libraries and all the money that you can burn to learn very little. So it's been a very strange uh, trip over the last couple of years. And so it's going to be more, of, more like that, you know, kind of odd uh, interesting tale. You'll learn some stuff, of course, but, um, you know, it, it's not going to be dead nuts, you know, put your butt cheeks here and plane here and put this peg here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what, what kinds of woodworkers do you think might be compelled to build this bench and put it in practice in their shops or, you know, what kind of, what value do you think this has for today's woodworkers? Um, I think, you know, for the beginning woodworker uh, who's in a, maybe in an apartment or has a g small garage shop, that you'd be surprised what you can do with this low bench that could easily sit, you know, in your kitchen if you wanted. Um, and you don't have to even own vices. You just have to find a slab and drill four holes and put the legs in it and drill some more holes for the pegs. And so I, I hope that it kind of just makes people think, that maybe they don't need that really fancy uh, bench to, to get started. And because uh, I started working with even less than that, I had no bench at first and was working on the floor more like a Japanese woodworker. And you can do a lot there too. Um, but in our tradition and our furniture was built at the very least with, you know, this, this kind of knee high bench. So I hope that beginners will, will see it and say, Hey, that's, you know, maybe that's for me. And I hope that, you know, more experienced woodworkers who, um, instead of building saw benches, for example, uh, two saw benches, if you have the space, one of these is like a spectacular uh, addition to a shop because it's uh, like two conjoined twins of saw benches and makes ripping easier, cross cutting easier. So many other things become easier. Um, and then the last is for that odd kind of woodworker that this can solve a problem. I've had a lot of people who are handicapped uh, contact and reach out to me about this might be offer some solutions for them that a high workbench couldn't do for them. You know, they can sit on the work. There's still some issues, but, but if they can sit in a wheelchair and move their torso around, they can really do a lot more things uh, than they could at a high bench. So really it's, you, you never know who's going to, latch on to it. I mean, I didn't think anybody would latch on to the French workbench. It took years before anybody really did. So you don't know. And so I, I put it out there, I test it, and then, you know, you see where it goes. Yeah. So then before we leave, I wanted to bring up something uh, that you didn't actually touch on in the article, but I know you're blogging about. I was really fascinated. You were talking about when you were building that the moisture content of the, the wood you were using was pretty high. It was relatively green wood. I think I remember yeah. saying something like 30% moisture content or something. So actually 60. 60? 60. Wow. So, so yeah, so really wet. And so what, what drove you to, to do that experiment? And, and then how did it work? You know, would you recommend that to other woodworkers building benches? Yeah, I touch on that in the book and, and we're going to be doing a future project that sort of demonstrates, uh, my ideas about it, but I really have a gut feeling that some workbenches were built completely green. Uh, you can't get a slab uh, dry enough, even in 13 years that we've tried uh, to get slabs completely dry. They're just not going to make it to equal, equilibrium moisture content, even in 13 years. So is somebody who's on the verge of starvation building furniture going to wait 13 years to, to do it? No, they're just going to 
grab what they can. And so by building with green wood, uh, you find a lot of things are easier, of course. I mean, I do a lot of build a lot of chairs, and so you, the, the wood is a lot more agreeable and manageable. And as long as you pick a, a wood that dries pretty easily, like we used red oak, which is very predictable, you're, uh, very little happens. I mean, I made one of these benches 60% moisture content and still installed vices on it and have had very, very little trouble um, with, with wood movement. And it's down, it was 60 and it's down to like 18. So it's, it's very much approaching EQ now, equilibrium moisture content. I can never say that. Um, so yeah, I would. I, I say don't pay for someone to kiln that wood. It's ridiculous. Uh, most kiln dryers can't even do it right uh, with really thick slabs. Things get unpredictable after four inches. Have a sawyer cut you a slab of something that can dry easily like red oak, which is very common. It's practically a weed. And, and, and make your bench and get to the good part. You know, it might, yeah, you might have to flatten it more often. Um, but if you can sharpen and you can wield a hand plane, that's a 20, 30 minute process at, at worst. So, you know, just, um, I don't know. I mean, we, we, it, it just amazes me how narrow minded we are about, uh, that all wood has to be this scientifically controlled material. It's not, it's, 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 it's a very forgiving and humane material and we can work with it at all stages. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's awesome. That's, that's fascinating. Actually, uh, Mike and I are looking at building a few Roman benches inspired by this. So I have one that's been sitting for about 200 years. So that's probably pretty stable. <laughs> Uh, we're going to need a second one. So I think we might pull one that's green and, and try that. So it's cool. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to hearing how it, it, it turns out. Um, I think the only downside to it is that I found is that, you know, your hold fast and any iron that comes in contact with the interior of it will start to rust pretty quickly. And that, that abates after about six months, but you know, we built Roman hold fast for this, which is a whole nother stupid story. And, you know, if you leave them in overnight, they, they come out looking, you know, furry. Uh, they're, they're so nasty. But uh, that's the only downside. But I'll be interested to hear what you come up with. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. sure. And congratulations on issue two. It looks like a great one. Oh, well, thank you very much. So and thank you, uh, viewers, for watching. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, if you want to order a copy of issue two, you can hop on our website, morrisontenonmag.com and read the full article all about the Roman workbench. Thank you.